Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Jill O'Connell and Crystal Arnott. Jill has 19 years of experience in the field as an administrator and volunteer coordinator and fundraiser working for the MSPCA. She accepted a position as executive director at the Lowell Humane Society in August 2008, and she currently serves on the board of the New England Federation of Humane Societies. Crystal's first job in the field was with the Lowell Humane Society. She was hired in 2008 as an animal caregiver and was quickly promoted to community outreach coordinator. She served as the animal care supervisor at the MSPCA before returning to the Lowell Humane Society as shelter manager and was recently promoted to communications and fundraising manager. It's not often that I have two people on the show together, so I want to welcome Jill and Crystal for joining us today. Thanks for having us, Stacey. Hi, happy to be here. You both mentioned in your bios how you got started, but how did you get the passion for community cats? I was really excited when we got a PetSmart Charities grant a few years back for a targeted spay-neuter. And even though we had been working for several years with Lowell TNR doing trap-neuter release, um, I hadn't actually been hands-on myself until we got that PetSmart Charities grant. And it didn't take long before I was fully addicted to trapping (laughs) and out at all hours of the day making sure that I was meeting the numbers to make that grant really happen and be successful. So I got involved in that a few just a few years ago maybe four years ago and I haven't looked back for me I think that as a director of an organization in in a city like Lowell you can't ignore the cats that are out there and for starting out with a shelter that had no spay and neuter programs didn't really have a lot of outreach programs we knew that we needed to do something so we started in smaller ways just by doing spay and neuter working with other organizations and the more that you start to work with other organizations and collaborate them and you find yourself out there in the streets and you see what your real problems are and we knew that Lowell had a serious problem with stray cats and lots and lots of kittens coming into the shelter and we had to figure out a way to solve it. Jill, when you entered the position at Lowell Humane Society in 2008, maybe you can share with our listeners what the city of Lowell in Massachusetts was like and what sort of the animal welfare environment was like at that point in time. There really weren't any options for people lower income to get their animals spayed and neutered and really vaccinated. As the Lowell Humane Society, one of the really only places that they could as a resource, we didn't have a lot of options to give them. We didn't have a vet. We didn't have clinics. So we started working together at first with ARL. They had a um, spay wagon would come down here, but it couldn't really come down here quite consistently because they had a lot of other communities they were serving. And then, as you know, we started working with uh, Murphers with the Catmobile coming here. And we were probably the busiest location because there was such a need for the community. They were jumping on the opportunity when these resources were made available to them. And it was really incredible to be able to offer those services. Five years later, there's still people that call constantly looking for lower income services. And for us to actually have places to be able to refer them to is really important for the city. Um, And the residents are willing to take full advantage of it. And then we're gonna just do a quick fast forward through to now we're at 2016. How has bringing low-cost spay and neuter into the city, as well as a TNR program, how has that impacted the number of cats coming into your facility, as well as sort of what are your general thoughts about how life is like for cats, the free-roaming cats in the city, too? I'll let Crystal touch on that, but I just figured I would give the numbers first. Um, when I first started, we were taking in probably between seven and 800 kittens a year. I think we were under 200 this year. So the percentage drop has been incredible. Um, but for someone that's worked in rescue and sheltering for as long as I have, the fact that we are able to place an 18-year-old cat or a 14-year-old cat that has kidney issues, 
those are things that we weren't able to do 10 years ago because we were just so overwhelmed with the volume of animals. So we can give a lot more care and attention to those special needs animals, those geriatric, those senior animals that really need our help. And we're able to work with them, which I find to be the most rewarding aspect of where we've come in the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, I think it's a really great opportunity to be able to work with cats that typically would get overlooked. And it's giving the community an opportunity to realize how great it is to adopt an adult cat. Oftentimes people would just come in looking for kittens and we had plenty, so there was no reason to steer them otherwise. But without kittens here in the building, most of the time, when people come in, we're introducing them to those individual cats and they're really making a connection and finding homes for those older cats at a much quicker rate than we ever did before. Our length of stay is only about 21 days at this point for adult cats. And I just think that's really fantastic that they're in the shelter for such a short period of time. And you do a lot of special adoption events too, to help move the adult cats into homes, correct? We do a few times a year. We kind of reserve it for when we're getting a little full and at capacity. Uh, but most of the time, we, we don't even need to really do that for to move them out. You know, the summer months when we start to fill up, we'll usually offer some sort of fee waived or reduced fee event. But most of the time, I think we only do it twice a year now. So it's really great. So I'm going to actually reference our listeners to our first episode with Laura Heffernan um, talking about her work in developing Lowell TNR. But I thought maybe, Jill, you could touch upon um, the relationship that Lowell Humane Society has with Lowell TNR and how you've worked together over the years. For anyone that hasn't sort of collaborated with organizations or groups that have different views than you, it can be a little scary to start. You feel like everybody's walking into their room with their own agenda, which is different than yours, and you kind of struggle with how are we all going to come to an agreement and how are we going to be able to work together. But when you actually get into that room and you share ideas, you realize that ultimately, no matter how we operate, we all have the same goals and that's to help the community cats. And once you get past all the other stuff, working together becomes a lot easier. There's certainly struggles when you have different philosophies and different ways of doing things, but you have to really look at the bigger picture. Laura has been great for that. You know, she's been able to see that we don't necessarily agree in certain areas, but this is how I feel. This is how you feel. How can we work together and how can we make this work for the cats that are out there? And I think we have a really unique relationship in that way that we've been able to do that now for geez, almost five years, I think. <laughs> and the, the number of animals that are coming into the shelters and the number of calls that we're getting about stray cats and feral cat colonies are reflective of what a great job that both organizations have done with working together. So the number of calls has gone down significantly over the years, correct? It has. I mean, most of the, now we just refer most of those calls directly to Lil TNR. So we're not even receiving as many, but what I see and what I know how I can tell we're making a difference is when I get a call about a colony, Lil TNR is getting to that colony and able to check it out in a very short period of time. Whereas before they would have to put it on their list and they would get to it once they got to the other six colonies that were ahead of the list. But now, you know, the calls are less and less. So they're able to get out and look at the situation and evaluate the situation in a much quicker basis. And that means that those animals get help and get spayed and neutered or get medical care much quicker than they were in the past. And now let's take a moment to listen to a few words from our sponsors. Accidental Exiles by Bruce Perry. Jesse McAllister, a young Texan and a rock war vet, escapes to Europe where he seeks a new direction and to heal his desert wounds. Wandering the streets of Escona, Switzerland, he meets and falls in love with a beautiful Italian waitress named Sonia Altarelli. Since the horrors of combat he encountered with a boyhood friend, Jesse will have nothing more to do with war. This story is his farewell to arms. Check out Accidental Exiles on Amazon.com today. Are you starting to think about that special holiday gift? Why not give the gift of a Community Cats podcast branded t-shirt, coffee mug, bag, or other item? This is the perfect way to spread the word about helping community cats. The proceeds from the sales will go to support the Community Cats podcast and the Community Cats Grants program, which helps small groups grow their fundraising programs to be able to fund more spay-neuter programs for free-roaming cats. Go to www.communitycatspodcast.com and click on our shop button in the menu bar today to get that perfect community cat gift right now. Thank you, everybody, for supporting the show. So in the scenario that you get a phone call about 
a couple of cats or a group or a mom cat and kittens at a location and you're asking Lowell TNR to go check it out, what's the process for either Lowell TNR, their volunteers, or just the general public on handling say, you know, if you have a stray cat in your backyard, what are we supposed to do? It's really an individual basis for every cat, every call that we receive. And we have a conversation with the caller to figure out what the best method would be for that specific cat. And the first thing we always ask is if the animal is injured or seems to be in poor health, uh, in some sort of distress. And in that case, we automatically want them to bring the cat right in if they're able to get their hands on it. And if not, we'll work with low TNR or even animal control to go out and pick the cat up and get it in here so it can receive medical attention. Otherwise, if the cat appears healthy and friendly and is very confident, we typically ask people to put on a paper collar and let the cat roam the neighborhood. We write, you know, am I your cat with the person's phone number on the collar and we let them roam for a week or two. And if after two weeks or a week, no one has called to claim the cat, then we tell the people, you know, the good Samaritan who found the cat to bring it on into our shelter and we'll scan for a chip and go from there. But we're finding using this collar method that we're preventing a lot of cats from going missing because they're really right at home in their neighborhood in the first place. So it's been really successful in helping keep cats out of the shelter that don't really need to come into the shelter. I'm really, really happy with the results we've seen since implementing this last year. And are you finding those cats are already spayed and neutered or undetermined? The ones that actually we do receive the calls for, for the most part, are already spayed or neutered. We can't always say for sure because we aren't physically seeing them most of the time. We're uh, instructing the community on how to make the paper collar out of just a piece of notebook paper and a piece of scotch tape. So we don't necessarily always get to look at the pet, but we do advise the Good Samaritan who puts the collar on to have a little conversation with the person and let them know about any discounted spay and neuter programs that are out there. And it's really nice because it's getting the community even more involved in taking care of our community cats and spreading the word about programs that are available. Now, the reason you sort of implemented this protocol is for a concern of basically scooping up somebody's owned cat. Well, we started posting, I think, um, as a shelter, every single stray cat that comes into our shelter, we post on social media. And we have a pretty good following. And a lot of people will share all of those cats. And so it kind of was opened our eyes to how many stray cats that we have coming in here and how many are in good shape, good physical condition, well cared for and made us start questioning, is it really an abandoned cat? Is it really a cat that's not cared for? I think, you know, that really opened our eyes to how many we're seeing and people would start commenting, oh, you certainly have a lot of stray cats in Lowell. And we would like start looking at that. And then we had seen a presentation from the Humane Society of the United States with Katie Lisnick, who's very passionate about community cats and really listened to what they were saying and, and some of the things that they were doing um, about, you know, letting cats just be community cats and that, you know, are you really saving them or are you helping them get lost. And it really stuck a chord with us. And we started taking little bits and pieces of what we were hearing from that and trying to see how we could incorporate it into what we were doing here. And it wasn't a quick change. We definitely did a slow transition, started with a few cats. Well, let's try this here or let's do that there. You know, we still kind of juggle with how we're going to do it. Some people, if they find a cat, they don't want to put their personal phone number. They just don't feel that close to their neighbors. So we advise them they can put the shelter number. We have a log. We keep track of anybody that might be calling us saying, my cat just came home with this collar and it says, call you if from lost. If, if I'm your owner. So we have to keep a log and know who we're talking to. Mm -hmm. So we still kind of uh, are changing the way that we do things. And being in New England with the cold weather, we'll probably have to make some other changes come winter. Um, so it's definitely evolving. And it's what I try to avoid is just having it be so structured that you can't change it and you can't do what's best for each individual animal. So we have to look at animals on an individual basis and judge each circumstance that way as well. Do you think that this program works better now than, say, implementing it back in 2008? Or is it something that, you know, really could be helpful at any sort of lifespan of what you're entering into in a community? I think it does work better for us now because we are seeing a lot more spayed and neutered animals in our community. 
back in 2008, I think the majority of cats that were coming into our shelter, very, very few of them were spayed and neutered. So this might not have been the right program at that time. Whereas now we're in a, a different place and it's definitely, you know, where we're getting these big fat cats that we know are spayed and neutered. Guys, the guys that are, we know are neutered, we might keep here and neuter them. Um, so that's why I say we changed on an individual basis. But we're seeing a lot of these cats that we're finding are going back to their owners or belong to the neighbor next door. They're spayed and neutered. They're well cared for. They're not unkempt. And I think we're in a very different place as a community than we were five years ago. It sounds like you also, you have the opportunity to really think one individual case through just because you don't have the volume of animals that you were dealing with back in 2008. Definitely. And I mean, I guess maybe it's, this is sort of the watchdog way or watch cat way of doing things to really ensure that if there is an abandoned cat out there, that that cat will get the services needed, but you will ensure not to take somebody's owned cat into the program. And I don't know how often over the years that has occurred where someone has called in and said, you took my cat or you have my cat. I don't know how often reuniting. Uh, My understanding is the statistics are quite low for cats. Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know when the last time they did it, the survey, but I think, you know, that we've known the statistics of about 2% of cats that come into as strays to a shelter or get reunited with their owner, and it seems to be fairly accurate. You know, we're trying to change that. You know, most people, if they have an indoor outdoor cat and their cat doesn't come home for two or three days, they're not, you know, rushing to the shelter to file a loss report. You know, they just figure, oh, he's out parole and, you know, he's checking mm-hmm. the city. He found somewhere else to hang out for a little bit. Um, and they sometimes will wait up to a week before they even call a shelter if they know that's what they're supposed to do. So um, this is just one way if their cat shows up with a collar, um, A, we can let them know that we're here. If they call us, hey, by the way, you know, did you know the Little Humane Society is, you know, around the corner from you? This is what we do. We can get your cat microchipped if you're interested in doing that. And we can kind of talk to them a little bit about responsible pet care. And if they are going to have an outdoor cat, here's some tips that you can do to ensure that your cat is safe. Good points and good ideas. Crystal, I actually just want to ask you a quick question. Since so many organizations are interested in, um, you're now in charge of fundraising for Lowell. How is life for you as a fundraiser and what are your challenges? I think we've seen a really big increase in the need to fundraise specifically for medical care. Like Jill was saying earlier, because we are able to work with these older cats who sometimes come with additional medical issues. And, you know, it can span from serious medical issues that need chronic care or basic things like dentals. I think almost every cat over the age of eight that comes in needs a dental now. So raising the funds to meet those needs has definitely been an increased stress. (laughs) Because we, I think, spent around $50,000 in medical care last year alone. When we're getting these animals that are not the basic small fluffy kittens that can get spayed or neutered and pop right out the door, we're looking at longer term care in the shelter for their medical needs, diagnostics and blood work. So it's definitely increased the need for fundraising. But at the same time, these stories are so much easier to get across to the public and for people to see that face and understand exactly what their money is doing really helps as well. So while it the, it's increased the amount of money we have to raise, it's also giving us even a little bit more to work with with these specific stories of these animals who need you know very specific medical things. And you fundraise through like a crowd fundraising page. Is that how you do it for these cats? Oh, we do it all. (laughs) We do a lot of crowdfunding pages. We just signed on with a new platform that we really love called classy.org. And we also do things right in the community. We have a lot of volunteers that will feel particularly connected to a certain pet and they'll hold a bake sale or a dining to donate night at a local restaurant. We have a couple of restaurants that'll let us have little concerts and raffles at their spots. We also, of course, do, you know, our appeal letters. We always include a little bit about the animals that we've helped in those. So we really try to make all of our fundraising be widespread and offer a little bit, you know, something a little different each month so that people have various ways to give back. Jill, if folks are interested in finding out more about Lowell Humane Society and the programs that you have and finding out more about how you've worked with Lowell TNR or the Community Cat Protocol, 
How would they find you? And the easiest way is probably our website, which is uh, lowellhumanesociety.org. We also have a ton of staff and volunteers that are very into social media. So we can be found <laughs> on Twitter. We can be found on Facebook. We can be found on Instagram. And you can always come into the shelter. We're open six days a week. Our hours are posted on our website. And our phone number is 978-452-7781. And Crystal or Jill, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? I think it's really important to get your community involved. I think a lot of people have an idea that the community is mean to cats or people are mean to cats. And when you open up and really start talking to people, you'll find that a lot more people really love cats. And once they truly understand what you're doing, they'll want to help and they'll want to be a part of it. I think it's just important for rescues and shelters to know that the way that you operated last year or five years ago may not be the way that you want to operate next year and to always be open to trying new things. I think it's really ironic that as shelters, as we take less and less cats and we don't want stray cats coming in, we don't have community cats coming in. You know, For the first time, we actually have space and room in our shelter, but we realize that it's just because we have space and room, it may not be the right thing to do to take them in. So I think you have to be open to new ideas and open to structuring your organization in different ways as you know times change. That's a great point. It is nice to learn from the past, but that doesn't necessarily chart your course going forward. Exactly. Well, ladies, I think you are now the second or third podcast that I've had where I've had two people on the show. So I want to thank you both for joining me today. And I hope we'll have you on the show in the future. Thanks, Stacey. We enjoyed it and hope that we can be back sometime. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes, leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 